So throughout time of any type of media, whether it be movies or shows or anything like that, whenever there happens to be a sequel, a trilogy, a spin-off, etc., I would say around 90% of the time, it tends to suck. Or at least when it comes to trilogies, for example, there always tends to be one bad egg, sometimes even multiple. But on a very, very rare occasion, there happens to be a trilogy that masterfully comes together. The studio will once in a while find a trilogy that actually flows. It has a beautiful overarching story where each movie at the same time has its own unique message behind it. And to say that I was surprised to find out that, that that perfect trilogy does exist and it happens to be How to Train Your Dragon? Boy, I would have never guessed that, I'm not gonna lie. And the reason I would never guess that is the fact that I saw the first movie and don't get me wrong, the first movie was great. I love the first movie, but you know, when they come out a second and third movie, I always tend to just be like, eh, like I don't, I don't really care about watching a sequel or, or tree or, or trequel or threequel, whatever you, uh, I don't know. But I was so surprised when it actually kept me engaged throughout watching the entire trilogy. Funny because a lot of people told me, oh, the third movie's like the bad egg of the bunch. So I ended up watching the second movie. It's like, oh my God, how, how can this be better than the first movie? And then I watched the third one and I was like, yeah, this one's probably gonna be okay you know it's the third movie out of the bunch everyone's saying it's not that good but it was like i i am actually having an issue trying to figure out how to rank these which by the way i will actually rank these three movies at the end of this video if you so happen to care but every movie was great and personally i don't even think it's the story necessarily it's more of just the characters especially when it comes to hiccup and toothless just the development of those two together and, and being the complete same person they're parallels of each other but just of a different species and they kind of go on a similar journey together while at the same time having their own journeys that are similar to each other as well it starts out that they're both the outcasts they both don't really want to hurt anyone and also they are having trouble understanding their purpose in life being the outcast and the conclusion to the story which is why i consider the third movie so freaking good is just mm, mm, just the cherry on top of this and i feel like the reason the characters feel so real and relatable and it kind of immerses you in in that movie is the fact that a lot of the voice actors actually recorded this in the same room so they were actually feeding off of each other's dialogue rather than you know one dude coming in one day recording their lines the next person comes in another day you know records it separately and with that you start to form a really strong connection with every single one of these characters and the score boy the score there is no reason that this movie should have such a good soundtrack behind it. There's moments in these movies where the visuals and the music just perfectly blend with each other and you just, oh yeah, I, I love that. And this of course was composed by John Powell. You know, the man who also did the music for Shrek. Actually, when they were doing like a behind the scenes interview situation, they were talking about how they wanted the uh, composer to kind of have his moments in the movie. Cause you know, a lot of times it's just supposed to be background music when it comes to movie music. But there's so many scenes in these movies that have zero dialogue, which also are gonna talk about later. But basically what I'm trying to say is there's a lot of scenes in this movie that don't even have dialogue, but are still just jaw dropping. It's so damn good. So each movie kind of has Hiccup and Toothless dealing with their own uh, separate internal issues. And each movie is a different type of internal issue. The first movie mostly deals with Hiccup trying to uh, come into himself and really learn who he really is because you know he's trying to be a viking because his father's the chief of the village and it's pretty obvious that's just not what he's cut out for and he finally realizes who he is after bonding with toothless and i feel like that main dilemma is something that all of us really deal with at one point or another you know trying to fit in with everyone else trying to conform but in reality all you're doing is shooting yourself in the foot instead of just being yourself and doing what you're good at and finding your path rather than trying to follow someone else's because if you're busy following someone else's path then you're just going to completely walk away from your own path but the movie really introduces the dilemma and the conflict that we're going to see throughout this movie as we see hiccup you know surrounded by a bunch of buff 
ripped, beefy Vikings, being the son of the chief of that village of Vikings. He is the complete opposite physically of them, just being really scrawny and skinny. However, he makes inventions in order to make up for his lack of strength, but a lot of times those inventions seem to get in the way and even cause disaster at times. So much to the point that when he finally catches a dragon, and not just any dragon, the Night Fury, the dragon that everyone in the entire village has feared, especially his father. So after Hiccup tries to tell his father that he actually caught a Night Fury or at least knocked it down and now he's trapped in the woods somewhere, his father just says, no, his father just ends up writing it off as Hiccup, you know, trying to mess with it. And I love Gobber as a character. Uh, he actually pinpoints the main issue of Hiccup in general right off the bat. They really make him out to be a goofy blacksmith that's just supposed to be a comedic relief character, but he always ends up coming in randomly with like these wise comments that really hit. Stop trying so hard to be something you're not. I just want to be one of you guys. Like, I love these lines so much because this is something that I've dealt with and like I said before, many others have dealt with. That feeling of not fitting in, that feeling of being around all these people who do these amazing things and you wanna do those things too, but maybe that's just not in your skill set. Maybe that's just something that you're not cut out for and you need to actually go for your own path rather than try to do something that's just not gonna happen. Actually, let's scratch that. Let's phrase that another way. Instead of trying to go for something that's out of your skill set necessarily, maybe just don't do what they're doing. Find a different path toward the same thing that they're doing in a different way. Like there's a scene where Gobber's talking to Stoic about basically being a father and Stoic we obviously could see classic father type he was raised a specific way, so now he believes that this is the right way to raise your child. But he's having trouble understanding Hiccup because Hiccup just isn't cut out to be a Viking. Or I wouldn't say that necessarily. He's not cut out to be the same Viking that Stoic is. He should be something different. And Gobber sums up Parenting 101 right here. All parents, listen up right here. This is right here. This is some good shit. You can't stop him, Stoic. You can only prepare him. So Gobber ends up convincing Stoic to let Hiccup go into dragon training for his own protection, you know, just so he could learn about dragons, while Stoic ends up going on a search to find the big dragon nest, which is like his big goal in life. And then we cut to Hiccup, who finds Toothless, the Night Fury, trapped in the woods from his trap he shot earlier. And in this one moment, Hiccup realizes everything that his father wants him to be and everything that he wants to be, I w in quotations, for his father in order to make his father proud, is just not him. He had everything right in front of him. A trapped Night Fury, the most rare, dangerous dragon in the world, at least in the perspective of the Viking. If he killed that Night Fury, he would get accolades from everyone at the village. He'd get his father approval, but, and he'll even end up getting the girl that also he likes. So, you know, everything is right in front of him but he couldn't kill the dragon. And oh my God, the details in the dragon's eyes right here. Damn. Damn. After Hiccup realized that he doesn't want to hunt dragons, his father told him that he will finally allow him to go into dragon training. So they kind of, you know, missed what when they were crossing ways there. And even though Hiccup is trying to tell him, hey dad, I don't want to do this anymore. His dad's like, uh, shut up, you're doing it. You're doing it. This is a really good example of how Stoic doesn't really give a crap about what Hiccup has to say. He doesn't really listen to Hiccup as his son. He doesn't really respect him at all. He just kind of, you know, writes everything he says off and tells him what to do. Classic father stuff. This conversation is feeling very one-sided. So Hiccup begins his training and pretty much throughout, he just gets bullied and not just by the other trainees, by the entire village. The fact that he's able to stay positive is quite impressive. Those who stay will look after Hiccup. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's more like it. But the next parts of the movie are probably one of my favorite parts because we as viewers are learning about dragons as Hiccup is learning about dragons. And the back and forth that we get between the scenes of him training and then hearing what the Vikings know about dragons and how Vikings perceive dragons. And then we cut to him, you know, going to Toothless over and over and learning about Toothless and seeing the differences of what the Vikings think compared to what he thinks. And he also learns a bunch of different secrets about dragons 
that Vikings don't know. But at the end of his training, he was given a book that has all the information of every dragon that he knows. And we could plainly see the bias that Vikings have of dragons because every single dragon listed here is listed as insanely dangerous, kill on sight. And then when it reaches the page of the Night Fury, literally all it says is run. If you see this dragon, run and hide and pray he doesn't find you. Just showing how fearful the Vikings are of just the unknown. But obviously this leads Hiccup to try to learn more about the Night Fury because hey, the Night Fury didn't kill him, so they're obviously wrong. The first big uh, bonding scene we get with Toothless and Hiccup is such a great scene. This is what I was talking about with the no dialogue and just music and just facial expression communication. Oh my, it's so freaking good. The cutest, like that, that's all I gotta say. He's the cutest goddamn animal in a movie to ever exist. Just the expressions he gives, communicating only physically through animation. I could be biased because I have a black lab shepherd mix. So, you know, the black face and the black dragon face kind of similar. And the moment when Hiccup draws Toothless's face and then Toothless proceeds to grab a big log and try to draw his face, preceded by Hiccup offering his hand to Toothless to accept him as a friend is so goddamn beautiful. It's getting wet up in the club right now, if you know what I mean. Not sexually. I'm talking about the, the tears. Didn't transition from the adorable, innocent face of Toothless to Vikings sitting around a fire talking about different ways to brutalize dragons. I'll chop off the legs of every dragon I fight with my face. Uh. Really kind of shoves us in Hiccup's shoes and really puts into perspective how big this issue is. With all of this conversation, he starts to realize as well, like, yo, this is kind of dangerous to even keep Toothless there because if a Viking ever finds him, he's good as dead. So using his experience and in inventions and in blacksmithing, he ended up making a little piece for his tail that broke, which is why he's stuck in the woods as he can't fly. And after he puts it on, he realizes it works, but it needs some contraption to keep it open. And then we get more of those scenes like I talked about of the back and forth of what Gobber thinks about dragons. And then we, we learn about dragons from Toothless. And then, you know, we keep doing that back and forth. And Hiccup starts using all of the knowledge he finds from Toothless into the training. So it looks like he's just starting to be really good at being a Viking. And each time it gets more and more impressive to the point that the entire village starts going crazy at how good he is at, you know, dealing with dragons. All the while he's creating a saddle and starting to fly with Toothless in order to control the little back fin. But Astrid, you know, the girl that he kind of has a little bit of a crush on, starts to catch on that something's not right here. You know, he can't just go from not doing anything to uh, destroying all the dragons. And she gets even more sussy whenever she accidentally spots him in the woods when she's training. Now, this next part of the movie is kind of a pivotal point with Toothless and Hiccup, like them really solidifying their bond. As Hiccup loses this cheat sheet that he made in order to control the flight, of Toothless. He almost falls to his death, but he finally gets control at the last second and they fly through a bunch of rocks. And this entire scene is so climactic and cool. Like it, it really gives you some butterflies in your stomach at this point. And another reason I love the little details you learn about dragons here and there is something so minute or, or, or simple uh, that you would think would be simple is actually something insanely important down the line. They wrote this in so perfect because it honestly looked like they wrote it as a little gag. This part where Toothless sees a little dragon trying to steal his food and then he blows a little puff of fire into his mouth. <laughs> Not so fireproof on the inside, are you? Seems like a very goofy, just supposed to be funny moment, but it actually is a very, very important thing that is the only reason they survive at the end. So Stoic comes back from his dangerous journey to find the surprise that Hiccup is now famous. The dialogue of Stoic is written written so well because they make it where he says the worst possible things unknowingly because Stoic doesn't realize how bad it actually sounds. All those years of the worst Viking Burke has ever seen. It was rough. I almost gave up on you. This part is just so sad because it honestly is relatable to a lot of people. And just his father being so excited to finally have something to talk about with his son, but he doesn't realize that, you know, that's not what's going on here. And what makes matters worse is Hiccup actually wins the final test 
of the, the dragon training course, which then puts him in a position where he has to kill a dragon in front of the entire town as a reward. So he ends up going back to Toothless in order to quote unquote escape as he's is saying. And then Astrid ends up following him out there. And so he had to end up telling Astrid everything that's going on with Toothless. And, and in order to convince Astrid that, you know, Toothless is a good dragon and dragons can be good is taking her on a flight. And boy, this is probably the prettiest scene in the entire movie. The transition of when Toothless like goes upside down and then back around and then it goes from day to night. It's, oh, 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 sheesh, man. But the flight ends on a sour note whenever Toothless seems to kind of be controlled to fly in a specific direction. And then they go into the dragon's nest and lo and behold, they see the alpha dragon, who apparently likes eating dragons as well as everything else. So they find out that the only reason the dragons raid their village to take food from them is in order to give that food to the big alpha dragon that's at the nest. So they're not actually trying to hurt anyone. All they're doing is just trying to get the food. But he ends up convincing Astrid not to tell anyone in order to protect Toothless, and she actually agrees. So Hiccup comes up with a plan, a risky plan, to show everyone the truth that dragons aren't bad in front of everyone in the town. Where he's supposed to kill a dragon, he's instead going to show everyone that he can just control dragons by just being nice to them. And boy howdy did Stoic get angry whenever he saw that Hiccup was not killing the dragon. He ended up hitting a piece of metal which caused the dragon to start attacking Hiccup. Hiccup starts screaming and then Toothless from miles away overhears this and he was actually able to get out of that area that he's been stuck in for so long and run all the way to Hiccup's aid in order to stop the other dragon. And unfortunately, this is the worst situation for Toothless to be in. Hiccup's obviously trying to explain everything to his father and tries to get him to stop taking Toothless, but his father, you know, being his father doesn't listen. He also mentioned that he found the dragon's nest and the fact that only a dragon can find the nest. So they ended up using Night Fury to like guide them to the big nest. And obviously Hiccup's like, yo, uh, there's something big, daddy. Like, daddy, there's a big boy out there you can't handle. And Stoic being Stoic's like, yeah, I can handle it. But you know, he's about to find out that he can. And the thing is, is I kind of like how they wrote Stoic because I don't necessarily think Stoic is like a bad father. I just think he's uneducated in being a good father, if that makes sense. I mean, this happens all the time when you're raised in such a specific way in such like a harsh manner, you believe this way. Like you believe this is the way to do everything. And when you're that age, change is like, no, like you, you don't want to change at all. Like after Stoic leaves the room, after saying the worst thing you could ever say to your son is, you're not my son. You could actually see the pained look in his face and the regret after he walks out but his pride keeps him moving. There's a part of him that truly does care about Hiccup. He just doesn't know how to go about it. But as they're taking Toothless to the dragon's nest, Astrid actually starts coaxing Hiccup like, yo, you should go save Toothless, all right? Come on, come on, come up with something, bitch. Do it. And just another insane shot. Like this shot is so cool. Whenever Stoic breaks open the mountain and he walks up to the giant hole, they shoot like a big fire rock into this hole and the light that is casted from the fire shows all of the dragons like hanging on the outside of the tunnel. God, it just looks so cool. But it seems that all of the dragons end up just fleeing. They don't attack anyone, they just leave. And that's when they realize, oh shit, something's coming, isn't it? So the gigantic alpha dragon appears and Stoic's like, yeah, we can't handle this. So Stoic and Gawr stay behind to distract the dragon while everyone tries to escape. And right when they're about to basically sacrifice themselves in order to save everyone else, Hiccup appears along with all of his other trainee friends that were in the, in the training, dragon training group, and they're riding on dragons. And as Hiccup was trying to get Toothless out of the wooden trap on the boat, the alpha dragon shoots a fireball and they get knocked into the water. And Hiccup almost drowns, but his father ends up saving him. And then, boom, delicious, tasty character development happens. Stoic dives back in to save Toothless after he realized, yo, uh, I think my son actually has a point. And how they end up beating the dragon is so cool because it has nothing to do with firepower, all to do with how smart Hiccup is. Because all Vikings are, are just, you know, punch 
anger, kill, violence. But Hiccup shows right here he's the complete opposite. He uses that knowledge that he learned from dragons early on. Remember about the fireproof insides? He flies the alpha dragon way up into the sky and shoots a bunch of holes into its wings and then dive bombs directly down and turns around, shoots a little fireball into his mouth, and then he explodes. He actually just like giant explosion when he hits the ground. Kind of hilarious. But the big blast ends up knocking Hiccup off of Toothless and then Toothless dives down to save Hiccup. So Hiccup ends up surviving, however, he lost a foot. Solidifying that big parallel between Toothless and Hiccup because now not only Toothless has a broken tail, now, you know, Hiccup doesn't have a foot. And the movie ends, you know, everybody in the town starts realizing the dragons aren't bad. You know, you can tame them, you can be nice with them. And, you know, good ending of a movie. Fantastic movie. All right, let's move on to the sequel. Now, this is the one that a lot of people consider to be like the best out of the trilogy. And I will let you guys know whether or not that is the case at the end of this video. But I completely understand why a lot of people consider this to be the best one. Is that the sequel, there's a lot going on. Like so many different situations happening at the same time. Yet it only happens within like a two day span. Whereas the first movie, you know, it happened over like a few months. And the third one, one is kind of the same. So it's really interesting how the second movie is actually the longest out of the trilogy, yet at the same time, it's more concise and everything kind of just happens in succession. But it ends up working out great. Now, the main internal dilemma of this one, because, you know, each one has like a little different one. Stoic is starting to say, yo, Hiccup, like, I can't wait for you to be chief now, you know, now that I'm proud of you and stuff. He has that fear that he just will never be able to live up to his father's reputation because, you know, his father is this amazing amazing warrior that's killed hundreds of dragons and is known throughout the land. And you know, Hiccup just sees himself as just a kid who can fly a dragon and that's it. He doesn't really foresee himself as a leader. And throughout the movie, it kind of shows his leadership is just different. He's taking a different path than his father is. It's not that he won't live up to his father's reputation. He's just going to be different than what his father was as a chief. And the villain of this movie is really good for Hiccup because it's the polar opposite of Hiccup, someone who won't listen to reason, uh, doesn't matter if Hiccup shows him that, he, you know, he could train dragons and stuff like that. This man's basically just bad. There's there's no other way to put it. The intro of the movie talks about how the town is basically transferred into a dragon uh, a town. They even made a sport out of flying dragons. But then we skip to Hiccup and we see that he's going on journeys here and there in order to map out the landscape as much as he possibly can. Also, he has a bunch of new gear. He has a nice get up and you know, a bunch of little like doodads and, and inventions all over him. And he's actually working on doing a little fly suit of his own where he could like do the wing, the wing thing and fly down. So Astrid catches up to Hiccup. They start having a little conversation where Hiccup's like, like, you know, I'm just not a leader. I'm not the leader type. I just, I don't think I can be chief. And it's cut off by them seeing a big cloud of smoke in the distance and then they run into dragon trappers. And these dragon trappers who are led by someone named Eret end up mistaking Hiccup and Astrid for someone else, which implies that there are different dragon riders out there. And also Eret mentioned Drago Bloodfist is apparently the leader of this group who is trying to make an army of dragons. Hiccup goes back to town and ends up telling his dad about Bloodfist and his dad instantly is like, lock the doors, everyone barricade, we're going to war. No in between, we're going to war. And obviously Hiccup is the complete opposite of that type where he's saying, no, I'm gonna talk some sense into him. And like I said before, Stoic says the line, some people can't change. However, Hiccup being Hiccup, he ends up flying out before they close the doors in order to go back to Eret to get quote unquote, captured and so he could talk to Drago. Also, I just want to mention the fire sword. That shit's cool. And like the, where, he, where he sprays like the, the gas and then he lights it and explode. That is the coolest weapon design ever. But anyway, before they end up taking Hiccup to Drago, his father catches up with them and then tells him like, yo, you need to go back home. But once again, Hiccup's like, dad, trust me. All right, I'm going to go talk to him. You'll see. 
He'll change his mind. And then his dad ends up telling him the story of Drago Bloodfist and how he knows him. Apparently there used to be like this round table of the leaders of all the Viking clans. And one day a random stranger came in, Drago Bloodfist. And he basically told them like, yo, you all uh, are gonna be underneath me now. And then they all started laughing. And then he sicked dragons on them, killed everybody in the Viking round table room except Stoic. So Stoic is obviously terrified of this guy. I mean, after something like that but hiccup still doesn't care he ends up taking off and going to talk to drago and then runs into a dragon rider with a cool looking ass armored thing i don't know what the heck it is but it's a cool get up that's all i'm gonna say but this masked dragon rider ends up taking him to a dragon nest and after this dragon rider sees hiccup kind of tame all these dragons who were a little bit aggressive at him and she walks up to him and sees a scar on his chin which verifies that this is mommy that was that's his mommy that's his mom so apparently how the story goes is she's always tried to talk sense into the vikings being like hey maybe we shouldn't kill dragons i don't know unpopular opinion but hey, maybe we shouldn't. You know, kind of the same exact way that Hiccup looked at it. And she was thoroughly convinced in this moment, whenever a dragon, her actual dragon, the one that she rides around all the time, this dragon actually stumbled upon Hiccup as a baby. And she went up there with the knife about to kill the dragon until she saw that the dragon was just admiring the baby boy. He wasn't doing anything. He was just being a cutesy little dragon. And then Stoic comes in guns ablaze and you know, swinging his ax everywhere, screaming. And then the dragon ends up taking his mother with him. And then since the mom, you know, has differing beliefs of dragons and stuff, she was too afraid to come back and tell them that, you know, she likes dragons now. And I just wanna mention that shot that they have where it's like dark and all the dragons open their mouths and just like light a flame inside of their mouths. It's such a cool concept. But anyway, she ends up showing him the dragon nest and actually in alpha, apparently this breed of dragon is the alpha breed of dragon. And that's why, you know, it's freaking enormous and can breathe ice. I assume the quote unquote alpha dragon in the first one, was a meanie species. I don't really know about, they didn't really talk much about that. But the funny thing about this is that even though his mom, you know, she she loves dragons, she's very open-minded it seems. Whenever Hiccup said the same thing, he said to Stoic, like, hey, I'm gonna go change Drago's mind and you could come help me. And she just said, yeah, some minds can't be changed. So not only Stoic, but even his mom are both like, yeah, you, Drago's not, nah, -uh. he ain't gonna listen. And I feel like this movie really shows Hiccup's naivety uh, to these situations because you know he's, he's never really been much outside of the world of Burke. Believing that someone out there exists that is just so terrible that they're completely irredeemable to him just seems completely unreal. But he's about to find out yeah Drago ain't ain't that nice. So we get our introduction to Drago and yeah he's kind of a badass. He's able to control dragons by just going ah! And then the dragons just stop. They just get scared. Ah! You guys scared? You, you, you're submitting by my in, insanely scary scream. But basically, Drago rules everybody by fear. Not only the dragons, but also the people that work for him. Including Eret, you know, the dude from earlier who was the, the really good uh, dragon trapper. And Eret actually comes around to be a good guy. Because whenever Drago's like, you know what, Eret, you suck. I don't like you, even though you apparently are our best uh, dragon trapper. He basically makes the call to kill Eret, but Astrid's dragon actually jumped in front of all of the attacks and saved his life, which right there completely changed his mind because he's like, yo, the people who are supposed to be my, my friends, my, my group, my posse, they turned on me, but the dragons helped. And then we get this very emotional scene. There's, there's, there's a lot of emotion in this movie. First off with Hiccup, you know, meeting his mom for the first time and them bonding and like Hiccup kind of realizing who he is as a person. And But whenever we see Stoic lay his eyes on his wife after so many years and just seeing how she is like, afraid that he would be upset with her or mad at her and no he doesn't he's not upset he's not angry he's just happy to finally see his wife after all these years and then watching the scene of them singing and dancing together ah uh, it's just it's so beautiful because hiccups watching his parents be together and love each other boy i really hope nothing sad happens later on to ruin this uh really great moment Nothing, nothing sad. 
It's gonna happen, right? But all of this happy, fun family time was interrupted by Drago, of course. And we get this really big action sequence. And the action sequences in this movie are really top tier. But Drago apparently just stumbled upon another alpha species, just, I guess, on the fly. But his alpha was able to kill the other alpha that was controlling the dragons. So now basically Drago controls all of the dragons because he controls the alpha. And then we see the naivety of Hiccup where he tries to talk sense into Drago being like, why are you doing this? Dragons aren't trying to harm anyone. You shouldn't be doing this. And obviously Drago's like, yeah, uh, when I was a kid, dragons killed my entire village. So screw you, kid. So he ends up telling the Alpha to control Toothless to kill Hiccup. And just in the last nick of time, the very last second, Stoic jumped in front of the blast and died. Oh, God. Why? Why? It's actually pretty interesting because they were planning on making Gobber the one who jumps in front of the blast and dies, but they decided to go with Stoic because, you know, that's a heavier impact. And honestly, it makes way more sense because after they do a Viking funeral for Stoic, because, you know, Viking funerals are pretty like quick and normal because Vikings die all the time. And it was like a moment of now that Stoic's gone, Hiccup's just going to take his place. And after this situation with Drago and when he truly sees that there are just some people in the world you can't change and you need to make you know, hard decisions when it comes to stuff like this. With the help of Astrid, Hiccup ends up pulling it together and becomes that leader that everyone needs. But anyway, update, Drago took all the dragons. No more dragons for them, except the baby dragons. I guess baby dragons aren't controlled by alphas just because, you know, babies do what they want. So he decides to confront Drago and Toothless because now Drago is riding Toothless and he's gonna show him that the bond between Toothless and Hiccup are a lot stronger than an Alpha's little forehead tentacles tingling. But yes, with their bond, Hiccup was able to bring Toothless back to reality, Ope that goes gravity. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention, Drago completely annihilated Burke. Like, used the ice dragon and just decimated Burke. Like, this town has been through some shit. They must have some good construction workers. But anyway, right before Hiccup was about to die, again, from the ice breath of the Alpha Dragon, Toothless saves his life by his newly found little back tentacles that makes him kind of like Godzilla because he can make lightning and fire from his back now. And he ends up challenging the Alpha and winning. So now that makes Toothless the Alpha. So not only did Hiccup become chief, Toothless became the Alpha of Dragons. So basically those two are now like the king of everything. So the movie ends off with Burke basically going back to normal. Uh, everybody's back on their dragons. The town's looking great. But now they have even more dragons because now Toothless is the Alpha Dragon. And since Toothless is the Alpha Dragon, it kind of leaves off like, oh, now nothing can go wrong, right? Until How to Train Your Dragon 3. It goes wrong. Now, some consider this to be the weakest of the bunch. And I feel like the reason for that is they put a lot of... Uh, annoying slapstick side character bits in this movie, which I mean, I don't mind them, you know, just like the, the dumb side characters that are just funny because they're dumb, but I feel like it was too much. For example, Rough Nut was just a little bit too much in this movie. That's all I'll say. And also some people just might not like the romance because this is more of a romance oriented movie in a way, which regardless if people think it's not, you know, the number one out of the three, it's still a fantastic movie, especially as a finale to this movie. It puts a freaking bow on top of this nicely packaged present of this trilogy. But how this movie starts out, pretty epic they're doing like a dragon raid they all have like their cool dragon scale armor that they use for all the scales that the dragon shed off and we can see that what they're doing now is going to dragon trappers and uh you know destroying their stuff and get free in the dragons basically saving all the dragons they can and burke is now you know a really big dragon town a little bit bigger than normal more dragon but the main topic internal topic of this movie focuses on Toothless and Hiccup kind of finding their own way because Hiccup is fearing that he's nothing without Toothless and he's worried that if Toothless ever left him, 
you know, what is he you know, by himself? And also Hiccup and Toothless finally settling down with someone they love and Toothless finally finding another of his species. And this could be controversial opinion here, I feel like the villain in this movie is more intimidating than Drago, Grimmel. And the reason for that is it genuinely felt like someone was gonna die. Like it really did feel like he was gonna murder someone at some point. And also the fact that he is the one who murdered all of the Night Furies, which is why there's none left. And obviously when he overhears the fact that there is a Night Fury out there, he is gonna do everything in his power to make sure it dies. And on top of that, in his arsenal, he has a female Night Fury he's gonna use for bait. So Hiccup starts talking to Astrid about this land where dragons come from. It's, it's called the Hidden World. It's something that his father has been searching for basically his entire life. And that's gonna be, you know, like, like the big goal that uh, Hiccup has in mind throughout the movie. But Toothless actually ends up finding that other Night Fury that in the woods, you know, the one that Grimmel uh, is, is commanding. And he's actually using this as bait so he can create a bond with these two so he could use the other Night Fury to bait Toothless to do things. And it really starts to set in this separation that might happen whenever Toothless is struggling to fly by himself because he sees this other Night Fury who wants to fly with him, but Toothless can't fly. But right away, Grimmel infiltrates Burke, but they were actually prepared for this, end up setting a trap, but it doesn't matter because Grimmel has these two dragons that are like scorpion uh, dragons. They have like a scorpion tail and acid, breath throughout the trilogy i've never seen a more scary dangerous dragon than these guys and grimmel's motivations aren't the same as drago's they're actually different whereas drago wanted to have an entire army of dragons to you know control grimmel's the opposite he just wants to kill dragons. Like he just wants to kill all of them. He believes dragons are just tools and are just too dangerous to be kept alive. But after this situation where his two dragons break in and like destroy a bunch of Burk and destroy their main area, this puts Hiccup in a dilemma because does he really want to stay here and deal with the war to come? Because that's what Grimmel's basically saying is like, Yo, if you don't give me your Night Fury, there's gonna be some war. So he tells everyone about Stoic's story when it comes to the lost world of dragons. And he tells all of Burke that we should go find this place and then we could be happy and we could live together with the dragons and everything will be fine. So he gradually convinces everyone of this idea and they set off to go find uh, the lost world, basically. Now in this next scene, we have Toothless who's trying to impress the other Night Fury, or I guess, I don't know if it's considered a Light Fury or a Night Fury, because they did mention that it was a Light Fury, but other people call it a Night Fury. I'm just gonna keep calling it a Night Fury. But this whole scene, you know, it's comedic. It's a little bit, you know, stupid here and there, but memeable. There's some memeable moments in this, but it's pretty cute, especially the moment where Toothless uses the thing that Hiccup used to bond with him when they first met, drawing his face in the sand. And, and Toothless actually draws a face this time. You know, he's, he's been working on it. He's been practicing. And that actually gets the Night Fury to be interested in Toothless a little bit. And then she's like, yo, you want to fly with me? And then, yeah, he can't fly. And there's another situation where he's like, bro, I want to fly. I want this Light Fury's dragon bussy. Please. So Hiccup ends up going to the drawing board and making an invention so he could actually fly on his own without the need of a pilot. And while Toothless goes out on his own to find the other Night Fury and, and do a little, little dragon dance with the other Night Fury, he takes a different dragon and everyone else and they actually go to confront Grimmel. They actually try to set a trap for Grimmel instead this time. But once again, them two crazy ass scary dragons end up just plowing right through all of them and they all barely manage to escape, except Rough Nut. Rough Nut ends up getting left behind and this is a problem that's gonna happen in the future. But anyway, Hiccup starts like panicking in his head. He's like, oh God, what, what if what if Toothless never comes back? What if he doesn't like me? What am I gonna do if I don't have Toothless? It's And it's to the point that he doesn't even know what to do when he's by himself. He's so used to talking to Toothless and just having him by his side all the time. But anyway, Rough Nut, you know, being being left behind annoyed Grimmel so much the Grimmel's like yo get out of here you're annoying as hell but little does she know that he did that on purpose so he could use her as bait to find where uh all of the people are because if you guys remember before they all took the dragons and like flew to a different location on the way to go find uh the dragon nest like the the, the main one but in Hiccup's search to go find Toothless because he wanted to go find Toothless because he 
needs him in his words. He doesn't feel like he's going to be able to fight off Grimmel or, or win this situation without Toothless. But while they're searching for him, they end up actually finding the lost world, you know, the places where dragons originate. And this is where we see Toothless basically being the leader of all of these dragons next to his now partner. But unfortunately, Hiccup gets found out and Toothless ends up saving him and getting out of there. And you can kind of tell that Toothless is quite annoyed that Hiccup went to go find him because he was really happy there. But a great thing happened. The other Night Fury, she followed them. So that's basically like, yo, she's into you, like you're in, you got this Toothless. However, when Roughnut got back, the first question that he asked her is, yo, were you followed? Followed by him realizing that this Night Fury was actually just a trap the whole time. And lo and behold, boom, Grimmel shows up takes both of the Night Furies. I don't really know how he got them in those contraptions so fast, but Grimmel ended up threatening the other Night Fury in order for Toothless to command all the other dragons to not attack him. So this is the first time they're completely out of dragons. They got nothing left. This is the pivotal moment for Hiccup's character to realize that he's not worthless by himself. He can do like his inventions, his cool shit, all this cool shit that he makes. So what he ends up doing is getting everyone a wingsuit. You know, the thing with the squirrel, it looks like a flying squirrel suit. And they all fly down to the billions of ships down there, which ends up pushing all the other dragons to start an attack on them as well. And as a last ditch effort for Grimmel, he takes the other Night Fury, controls her with his purple needle juice, and Hiccup and Toothless end up chasing them. And Toothless was actually able to fight off all of those big, acid blowing scary dragon scorpion boys with his new lightning back attack but as hiccup dives on grimmel grimmel was able to hit a shot on toothless to knock him out of the sky and he's cascading down to his death he takes a purple mind control juice off of the other night fury and tells her to go save him as he lets go and falls toward his death and just so everyone knows throughout the movie this other night fury hates Hiccup. Like she, she's hated Hiccup this entire time, but she ends up coming around and just like Stoic did in the first movie, he actually went back to go save Toothless. She went back to go save Hiccup and Hiccup using his detachable foot, the one that he lost in the first movie, he detached it and then Grimmel falls to his death as the other Night Fury saves Hiccup and everybody lives happily ever after. The ending of the movie is, is a little bit bittersweet, but I love it because it's a perfect ending to this whole series. So how they end it is everyone parts ways with their dragons and Hiccup tells Toothless to take them all to the world of dragons and just live there. Because he believes that it'll just be better this way. Dragons will never have to worry about Vikings again. He'll never have to worry about dragon trappers, people like Grimmel or anyone else. They can just go live free and happy. And I love that the movie actually ends with a reunion because I feel like if they left it off at that, it would be a little bit too bittersweet. But him and Astrid have two kids and lo and behold, they float up on the boat to the entrance to the world of the dragons. And, and look who they see right on the edge. It's Toothless along with his other Night Fury partner and a bunch of little babies, a bunch of little baby dragons. And and at first Toothless was like, yo, who is this guy? Like, you need to get out of here. And then obviously he realizes who he is pretty quick. And then they have a nice little flying session. And then he shows his kids the dragons. It's a, it's a cute little, little section of the movie. I love this part. But all in all, fantastic trilogy i don't i don't think i've seen a trilogy that like comes together so perfectly especially in animation but we reached the end of the video let's hear what i think of these three in in ranking wise it doesn't really matter because honestly i feel like they're all great in their own way so the one i liked the least would probably have to be the last one and the only reason for that is i felt like there was a lot of uh empty space a lot of filler stuff, a lot of like comedic things that were thrown in there, which you I mean, don't get me wrong. I like comedic stuff here and there, but I personally didn't like it that much on the last movie. I like Grimmel as a bad guy. I loved the whole character development of, of them, you know, growing into their own people, uh, a, a Hiccup growing up to be like a, the, the best leader of ever of all time and Toothless, you know, becoming the dragon Lord. It's such a great finale, but yeah, I, 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 would, I would say it's probably my least favorite. And coming in number two, this was a tough one. I was struggling with this because visual wise, I feel like this movie's better. Be honest, 
visual wise, this movie's better. But I would have to say that number two is probably the first movie. When I, which I didn't really mention it when I talked about the number two and three movies, but the score and the visuals and everything were just as good as the first movie. I do personally think though, that the first movie had the best visuals and the best music. And obviously number one is going to be How to Train Your Dragon 2. There is just so much going on in that, that the, the emotions of his family finding to get together and then getting ripped apart, uh, Hiccup having to deal with his naivety of seeing someone who just can't be tamed, basically. Someone he can't talk sense into, you know, losing his father and getting thrust into maturity of being the chief. There's so much in that movie. It's a long movie, but it doesn't feel long. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. That's my review on the trilogy of How to Train Your Dragon. If you haven't watched it, well, I spoiled it for you. You should probably go watch it anyway. But thank you for watching. If you like this video and you want more like this, please let me know. Subscribe, like the video. You know what to do. You know, you know the drill. You know how it be. Bye bye.